But everyone's been so excited about um, you being here. And I'm also equally thrilled to have you here. Oh, thank you. Julia Ann, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Nice. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you. You look amazing. I said that before we started, but you really do. You look happy. I am. You are happy. You just got married recently, right? I did. January 1st. Wow. And did you get married in Hawaii? You Hawaii. Looked like you were somewhere tropical. Yeah. Hawaii. Uh, it was just me and um, him and my girlfriend and my other girlfriend, Jenna Fox. Jenna. She's so sweet. The funniest thing ever. She's <laughs> She's a riot. She's hilarious. I had hilarious because she doesn't mean to be. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had to drop her off at uh, the house, house, your house yeah. the other day because uh, we were shooting a scene for Twisties and we were using sparklers in the scene. And I guess the smoke from the sparklers made both her and Molly Stewart very sick. To be fair, like, like she very was sick. No, they were both sick. super sick. Like, I've never seen – she's one of these people – she's like a really rare breed in the world of working, period, let alone mm. our industry. But you could call her right now and be like, oh, my God, I had a cancellation. Can you be here in 30 minutes? She'd be like, I'll be right there. Like yeah. you know, it's like the weirdest thing. Like she could – it doesn't matter. Like she – can do it like she can muster it up no matter what's happening yeah and so uh when she came in and i literally poured her into a bed like she could hardly see hardly it was really kind of intense i was like wow uh, i've never really seen you like this i know i mean i had to drive her car to your place i was really worried about the two of them i Um, I was supposed to drive you back and then she's like no she wanted to take an uber and i was like well she doesn't want to get in my car i got it yeah i didn't want to get in your car because i don't want to spend any time with you so instead i invited you on my podcast (laughs) i just it was like (laughs) fucking midnight i didn't want you to have i was up back I know, but I just didn't. I was up. I, I was ready to come get her. Too. I was ready to come get her. I was like, I didn't. What, am I, what do we need to do? We like, yeah. what's happening? Yeah. All right. I like how we spent like the first like five minutes of this podcast talking about Jenna Fox, but she is amazing. I do love her. Excuse me. Like she lived with me for almost two years. Well, no, for two years. So um, yeah, I, there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> it makes total sense. But like, what's new with you, Jenna Fox? What's old with you, Jenna Fox? What's current, <laughs> Jenna Fox? <laughs> Oh my gosh. So, uh, Julia Ann. Yes. Um, I guess let's start from the beginning. Um, how did you get started in the industry? Um, well, let's see. Uh, my goodness. Uh, Janine was feature dancing. She was a penthouse pet. She said, I don't want to feature dance by myself anymore. Uh, let's do this thing called the duo act. And I was like, what's that? And she's like, you know, we're going to go to strip clubs and we're going to dance together and put on a show and we're going to get paid. And how did you know Janine? Um, because her husband at the time was the singer in a band that my ex boyfriend was the drummer in. Okay. So, okay. Gotcha. yeah, like that's how that all, all came down. Okay. It was rather, it was organic, you know, yeah. kind of like a thing. And uh, we were like 18 and 19. And um, so. In like 91, I was like, fine, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. So we called ourselves Blondage. And about a year into that, I recognized that the porn girls were commanding more money on the road, blah, blah, blah. And so I said, you know, I'm thinking about kind of getting into porn. And she said, oh, my God. It just so happened that this director named Andrew Blake asked me if I would do a porn. Let's do it. And then we did Hidden Obsessions. And there you go. And this was the scene. <laughs> I remember. I watched this when I was under the 18. age of 18. Under, 18. I was, I, yes. <laughs> sure, I was 18. <laughs> I was not. One plus eight. Uh, <laughs> um, and that was the scene with the ice dildo, right? Yeah. yeah. I remember. Oh, my God. I so remember that scene. And I remember thinking, like, that has got to be really cold. That's How? So cold. How was that? Because so, you guys played it off and it was so beautiful. And oh, Andrew was like such, you know, so legendary in his, the way he artistically um, created these, these porn um, scenes. And a lot of people these days don't know who he is, but he truly was like one of the innovators for that, that kind of like artsy erotic mm-hmm. stuff. Um, but I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, that couldn't have been comfortable. No, it was very, very, very cold. They had like a five of them uh we didn't have molds at the time so we had like five of them sculptured or whatever Mm -hmm. made and uh they were in the freezer 
of this house, and each time one would melt down to a certain point, we'd pull the next one out, and we'd start again. And, uh, yeah, no, they were freaking cold, cold. Um, was your vagina, like, completely numb? No, it? you know what? No, because, you, you know, you do something for a second, then you yeah. stop. Yeah. Right? So then you're like, it, it, you never really get numb. Yeah. But... You know, your your labia and your – all that tissue down there is not the same as the tissue like on your hands and stuff like that, mm-hmm. right? So um, what hurt more were, were my hands from holding oh, it right. because of all the nerve endings holding it. Yeah. Where even if you stop shooting for a second you pull it away, you're still holding it. So somebody had to keep running by with a towel and pulling it out of our hands in between takes – and then there was like a, a bucket of warm water, so we could put our hands in it. And wow. okay, it was it was cold. It was like a whole yeah. ordeal. And then one of them became a shard, and uh, she got <laughs> cut. And yeah, no, it was a thing. Like it was a thing. Like, wow! Yeah. All in the name of art. Mm-hmm. Well, it came out beautiful. Thanks. So, um, blondage was like a pretty big thing. I mean, it's definitely something that you're really well known for. Um, you traveled all over the place, did that, and then you got into porn Mm -hmm. and then, so you did shot for Andrew Blake and then Mm -hmm. where did you go from there? Uh, from Andrew Blake, I did more Andrew Blake (laughs) and, uh, um, because I, uh, the production manager actually for Andrew Blake is who I kind of stuck with Mm -hmm. and her husband, um, was a director called Freddie Lincoln Mm -hmm. and so I spent the better part of uh my career with andrew blake and freddie lincoln okay um and who did freddie direct for like um gosh metro uh caballero um sin city like ever like all of those you know mm-hmm. like there was it it was pretty much everybody yeah yeah all the big like he, he all the was, big studios yeah yeah so um, yeah, I just did. I worked for him and with him, and uh, that was it. And then I went to Vivid, and I was with Vivid for X amount of time. And then from Vivid, I went to Digital Playground, which I ran with my tail between my legs because it, it it's changed hands. Just so everybody knows, but yeah. at the time, like they were horrible, yeah, horrible, horrible people. And then, uh, so I, I left, which was great because they told my agent at the time, they were like, she's acting like she doesn't want to be here. And he said, funny she mentioned it because she doesn't want to be here. <laughs> like, yeah, the old, the, the old people that ran Digital Playground fought with us too. They were tough. We man. had a big fight with them over Tara Patrick, actually. They were tough. They sent us, um, cause there was, uh, you know, Tara, I think, was trying to get out of her contract. And my mom had shot her. Um, and then I think Tara wanted to shoot again, but like we weren't sure if she was still under contract. Mm-hmm. So I think we we asked them because we didn't want to get in the middle of some like yeah. kind of legal battle because they were very litigious. Yes, they were. And they sent us a letter basically saying that like Tara Patrick was still under contract and if we – were to shoot her, they would sue us. It was this very nasty letter. My mom framed it and hung it in the bathroom of her <laughs> studio. <laughs> That's so her. Yeah, That's it is so awesome. her. She was like, fuck you. That's awesome. But yes, Digital Playground is now owned by MindGeek. Completely different people. Yeah. So we're not talking about the current no, company yeah, the that current runs Digital. But uh, no, back then they were pretty tough. And uh, in fact, they... They loved rumors. I don't know if you remember this, but they they loved any any publicity was good publicity, and mm. so they would literally say vile things for publicity. It was like the weirdest thing, and they would pit the girls against each other for publicity. It was so strange. So um, all of a sudden, I hear rumors that I broke into their studio. I stole tapes that I was in, and then I lit them on fire in their <laughs> bathroom, and I was like. Have you guys ever seen their place? Like they had barbed wire rings around the top of the chain link fence. And how am I, am I mission impossible? Like (laughs) I could just see me like, like, like what's happening? Like I'm scaling chain link in order to, and, and barbed wire in order to get into a, a studio that has 
iron doors to get into safes in order to then just light them on fire in the sink like <laughs> i don't understand <laughs> or that i attacked her patrick with like a lit curling iron and i set her hotel room on fire like what i dude <laughs> now there's a little truth to that i'll give him that oh, okay but <laughs> but this is but this is the truth we were getting ready in her room mm-hmm we were in France. Mm-hmm. I had um, the thing that, that you can plug in your curling iron, but I didn't have the thing to dumb down the wattage. Okay. Yeah, because so, you're on different um, yes. frequen- – not so, frequencies, but yeah, because you're in Europe. Yeah. So, so in Europe, like their electricity is super, super, super strong. Yes. So even if you can get the plug that, the, that you can plug it in – you're supposed to get this other thing that like takes their electricity and makes it less than for yeah, your, converts it. Yeah, for your appliance. Well, I didn't have that, so I plugged it into the thing, and the thing to my 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 curling iron, I pick it up from the floor, it has burned a hole in the carpet in the floor, and when I pick it up, the barrel on it turns down slides like, like it off. melted yes yeah, slides off the wires which the wires are <laughs> sparking and they're like and i'm like oh my god and i throw it <laughs> of course into the trash can because i'm not terribly bright and so now they look the trash can starts smoldering <laughs> and i'm freaking out so <laughs> that's the story so was there a curling iron yes was there a burn in a carpet yes was there actually a fire no did i attack her no we were getting ready together in her room and i had to pay the hotel five hundred dollars to replace the part of the carpet wow yeah so but they liked that like right. that thing and uh, I just couldn't, so, so I ran with my tail between my legs. I was like, oh, "I'm out of here. You, you guys are morally reprehensible." <laughs> so then, so then I I went to, um, so then I was with uh, w- Wicked for a long time, and then I went on my own. And I gotta say, that was the best time uh, of my career is when I ventured out on my own. Mm. Now, when you so say much you, fun. Now you say you ventured on your own. What did you do? Did you start your own website? Did you just shoot freelance for other people? Like- no, I mean, I don't, I'd already had my website. Mm-hmm. But it was just all of a sudden I was able to meet after, God, from 91. So figure like a good 15, 17 years. Mm-hmm. I didn't meet three quarters of the industry. Mm. I was in a bubble. Yeah. Right? Right. So now all of a sudden, you know, I'm walking on set and there's people like going, oh, my God, hi, we've never worked together. But hi, who are you? Like, yeah. you know, and it's like, oh, well, I'm, you know, Quasar, right? Yeah. Like, I didn't know Mike. I yeah. didn't know him for anything. Yeah. Um, I didn't know Mick Blue. I didn't know Manuel Ferrara. I didn't know, like, I didn't know anybody. Right. Because I was in a bubble. Right. Yeah, no, I hear you. I um. I I never meet other producers. Like people are always like, "Oh, you know, do you know so and so?" And I'm like, "Why? How would I know them? I only work on my own sets." But yeah. having this podcast, I've met a lot of people. The first time I ever met Mike was on this podcast, and now we become great friends. He's so too much. He's hilarious. He's, he's too so much. he's so funny. He's too much. Um, we actually, besides Mike, we have a other friend in common that I completely forgot to mention. Um, Josh Lazy. Oh yeah, he's been on this podcast too. Oh. Okay. Yeah. You know, we're friends and um, not like Mike and I are friends, mm-hmm. right? He and I are friends like we've had pizza mm-hmm. like once and we've watched a movie once. Mm-hmm. and But he actually used to date Janine. Yes. That's how I know him. I know. He told me. And he was married to a girlfriend of mine that I used to scuba dive with. Oh, random. Yeah. So it was the strangest thing because she and I were actually friends um, and she had originally dated an ex-boyfriend of mine. Mm-hmm. So I really had never put anything together. Right. And so it, it was always like our relationship was always great, but we had always dated the same person before we got to know each other. So mm-hmm. there was always that like, mm-hmm. oh, that's our connection. Like mm-hmm. we dated the same guy. It's kind of weird. And then, um, one day she's like, wait a minute, you're friends with, wait, wait, are you talking Janine, Janine? And I was like, yeah. She's like, oh my God, she dated my ex-husband. And all of a sudden I went, oh my God. 
Josh. Yeah. And she was like, yes. And I was like, thank God we have something else in common. I was so excited. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 funny. It's like he knows so many people that I know, like just random kind of connections. Yeah. So having been in the industry for a while and seeing how things have changed, um, what do you – how do you feel about the way things have changed? Like from the big studios that, um, you know, had the contract girls and all the glitz and the glamour to um, – people being more independent and being able to produce their own content and kind of cutting up the middleman. Do you think that one is better than the other? You know, um, I don't know. Cause I don't know if I feel like there's, there's maybe third options that we haven't quite like, okay. broached. Like we, we had the companies that were a little bit more male oriented as far as owning it mm-hmm. and shooting it. And what's great is that now being that talent is doing their own stuff. So that means that women are, uh, I think probably at this point, a higher population of producer Mm -hmm. than men are. Mm -hmm. And even if we don't see like an individual doing their, uh, only fans as a business, technically they really are. So if they're directing and they're producing and they're putting up their own stuff, then technically like they're a company owner, they're, they're brand opener, uh, um, owner. And, uh, so I think that's awesome, but God, I wish there had been a sec, like an in-between where we had had, uh, more women owning bigger companies and less of them right as opposed to being so parsed out Mm -hmm. because um you know there's something about this whole internet craze of us all putting out our own stuff and there's so many of us as that we're becoming numbers to each other Mm. we're disassociating okay from each other um and it's becoming a dog eat dog and I, I, it's frightening to me. I have noticed that. So social media has been a big platform for people to, you know, bring up a lot of issues. Um, some of it has been really great. You know, women have been able to find their voice and call out people that I think needed to be called out. But as you said, there's also been a really negative element where people um, are quick to jump on the bandwagon of attacking and vilifying other performers yeah. without really knowing much about the situation. And I have noticed that on many occasions you've kind of come out as this voice of reason where, you know, you've said, Hey everybody, let's just like take a minute yeah. and let's not jump to conclusions and let's not jump on like the Twitter lynch mob right. bandwagon. Cause um, I don't have a lot of fear. Right. Um, like a lot of, uh, there's, here's the thing. Just because you don't hear a lot of people saying what I'm saying doesn't mean there's not a ton of people thinking it. The thing is the reasonable pe- people are less likely to speak. Right. That is a fact because reasonable people are afraid of getting attacked. They're afraid of being, becoming a part of something that they can't pull out of because the unreasonable people are uh vicious and and, and they taste blood and then they band together and they right. become pack mentality and then and you don't you don't want to deal with it like mm-hmm. reasonable people don't want to deal with it they want to put food on the table they want to take care of their families they want to get their health care at all possible they want to feed their dog like they do not want to deal with everybody's irrational bs right they just don't right where i have had my career mm-hmm you're not worried about what are you gonna do? Run me out? Yeah. <laughs> what are you gonna? You're not what worried you about pissing do? people off. No, I'm not. I'm losing not work. No. Yeah. No. And so, uh, I don't. I don't care. Like mm-hmm. I will tell you what I think if I feel it's appropriate, and um, and hopefully I'll have a decent debate with you or or conversation. Like one of the girls and I went back and forth, and here's the thing: I I really do adore her. Mm-hmm. I I think that there was. In my opinion, she lost a little perspective, especially since there were other things that have happened in the past that she was more attached to. Mm -hmm. And so she she acted differently in those things. Like she was concerned more about the person that was actually being lynched, Um, where in this case she became the lyncher. So Mm -hmm. I sort of had to remind her, just because you don't like this person doesn't mean – don't forget, it yeah. wasn't that long ago that you had concerns over this other person, and it was really kind of similar. 
Um, but at the end of the day, I could say to her, I love you. I adore you. Mm -hmm. I don't have to agree with you here, but I respect you. Right. You know, and to me, that's a, that's often missing, you know, you're either with me or against me. And that seems to be the internet. You're either with me or you're against me. And there's no, hey, babe, I'm with you in theory, but in, in this particular situation, I'm not with you in it. I, I'm with you having the right to feel and do and think for yourself, but I'm not with you. I can't carry that torch with you because mm-hmm. I don't agree with it. And, right. and that's not handled well Mm -hmm. it's not handled well on the internet at all because it's too easy to not see somebody as an individual it's too easy to group so instead of looking at you and saying i see you as a person on the internet i can see you as white i can see you as privileged i can see you as a woman i can see you as a man i can see you as um if you're black, oh, you must be Black Lives Matter. If you're Mexican, you must be, you know, go back over the wall. If you're like you you take individuals and you make them part of a group on the Internet, it's very easy to take the individuality away from people, mm-hmm. lump them together as a way to devalue their voice and to shut them down. Mm-hmm. And then you don't have to contend with something you don't agree with. Right. But unfortunately, you've also shut down the discussion. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely like serious polarization going on, I mean, in this country yes. and on social media. Do you think that social media has, in a sense, made our lives better or worse? Or is it kind of a mixed bag? It's a mixed bag. But, you know, if you were to tell me that there was more or less benefit to it, I would say that there's less benefit to mm-hmm. it. There is benefit to it. Yeah. For sure. But there's also – but but I, I don't – in a risk-benefit analysis, I would say the benefits, I don't know that they outweigh the risk. I just don't know that they do. I, I, I Like I said, I think it's too easy to disassociate from individuals, from yeah. humanity with – social media and instead of me listening to you and going I hear you Holly as a person I'm looking at you in your eyes and I'm talking to you and I hear you and yeah. I, I don't necessarily agree with you but I could totally hug you when this conversation's over because mm-hmm. I see you as a person instead on the internet I see you as blonde I see you as white I see you as 134 characters I see you as as this I see you as a group I don't see you as a person, as mm-hmm. an individual with your own feelings, your own needs, your own experiences. I've already decided who you are. I've already decided what you are according to the group that I have now believed you belong in. Right. And so therefore, you're just one of them. Mm-hmm. And now I don't have to talk to you because you're part of the problem. Yeah. I did, I took away all your individuality. Mm-hmm. And I threw all of my bias on exactly what I thought, what group you belong to, and what your group stands for. And it's like insane. That is the thing that gets people depressed. That's the thing that gets people suicidal. That's the thing that gets people angry. And and it's the thing that it, it tears people apart. It tears groups apart. It's not bringing us together. It's just not. Even the Me Too movement, it's fabulous. But why is it just women? Like I understand that there is a, a – that the percentages of women that have a, some sort of a, a bad sexual experience or something revolving around sex, extremely high, extremely high. I do think, however – for us to only apply it to us, us then then it, it eliminates the group, the very group and the very and the individuals that are male or non-binary or however it is they identify. We're we're making it men and women, and now we're like leaving out like all these individuals. Mm-hmm. But individuals are hurt. Right. It's not just a group. Individuals are hurt. So now. You've got a bunch of men going, I'm sick of the Me Too movement because it's all about women. It's all about you guys. And you, I was sexually assaulted. Mm-hmm. You don't hear me griping about it. That's what you've actually alienated almost half of the demographic, the half that you say you would like better from. 
you've actually alienated, you've insulted because not all of them are that way. Right. And you've turned them into the enemy. So how are you going to turn to them now and say, I want, can I please ask better from you? Mm -hmm. They're like, fuck you. Yeah. Look what you just called me. Yeah. So. That's the thing. It's like people have taken that to such an extreme where it's like almost every thing that men do that people don't deem inappropriate as some kind of attack. And it's actually almost created this environment where people are so quick to, you know, jump on the me too bandwagon that like women like me, myself, sometimes I'm afraid to like say that I think maybe this is taking it a little bit too far. Maybe, you know, you accusing this guy now you're going to be of right, but no, but now that you're going to be part of the, what is it? Uh, you're going to the status quo. You're going to be part of the status quo. Right. Look at you keeping patriarchy alive. You know, it's, and it's unfortunate because you can't have a voice. The second you say as a person, I'm feeling something that go, you don't, you're not thinking that as a person. You're thinking that as a woman who's betrayed women. (laughs) How dare you speak with your hidden penis? God, you know, it's, it's just like ridiculous. Yeah. And instead of me going, no, I'm just kind of a rational person that's throwing out maybe an option to think about right. that, you know, I know a guy that came up and was like, you know, I gotta be honest with you. Like I got drunk. I woke up the next morning. I looked at the girl and I was like, did we have sex last night? And she was like, yeah. He's like, you had sex with me while I was like kind of passed out. And she was like, yeah. Like that's a, like, it's not a thing, right? right? It's like, it's not a thing, right? Had the girl looked at her, that guy, and been like, did you have sex with me last night while I was passed out? He would have been like, fuck no. Because <laughs> cause he already knows that that's called rape. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, but but he was like, did that just happen? And she was like, cool with it. Like, you know, cause you're a dude, like, and mm-hmm. I'm a chick, so you should be cool with the fact that I violated you while you were passed out. And then afterwards, he was like, you know, I don't know. I guess no big deal, I guess. And I was like, now you're the chick that we're talking about, right? right. Now you're the girl that's like, I'm going to pretend it didn't happen and just be like, well, I guess, you know, I can understand where you know, now you're apologizing for her. Like, so I, I don't know. Like, okay. Get- but then the, the argument that people always have, though, is that you can't rape a guy because his penis has to be hard in order to have sex with him. And if his penis is hard, that means he's, he's turned attracted. on, which automatically means he's consenting. Which is clearly not true because he was passed out. Right. And you can't get a hard on when you're asleep. Anybody who has any like rational thought whatsoever knows that a guy can wake up with a tent. Um, we all know that also at this point, I'd like to, I'd like to think that we all understand that even when a man is completely terrified, their body can still give them a hard on because it's about the blood. It's Mm -hmm. about the blood rushing. It's Mm -hmm. not only because they're sexually turned on. There are other ways that this happens. Mm -hmm. So it's just not rational. You're not listening to a person. You're you're making that guy part of the group, and then if the group can't be raped, so that guy can't be raped. Right. You know? That's not fair. Right. It's just not fair, and it's unfortunate, and I don't think social media has really helped us in that. I, I, I feel like, sure, it's gotten a lot of things out, and some women have gotten some stuff off their chest, and some men have gotten some stuff off their chest, sure, but it's – but we're just individuals, and we're just people. Right. And we're – playing with something all of us thinking we're a professional playing with a very dangerous toy Mm -hmm. and we're none of us are professionals and we're just wielding this thing around the problem is is giving a platform to everybody to speak and you know a lot of people don't think about what they say or they stop sometimes and go did i ask your opinion yeah i know right when i put on my look at my new tattoo they're like you need to erase that why would you do that i what were you thinking what no 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 you're on my social media because you want me to share my life. Right. I'm sharing it. I'm not asking for permission. Right. I'm not asking for you made a mistake when I said, look at the tattoo of my dog. You thought there was a question mark. Clearly my punctuation <laughs> did not show a question mark. 
Right. And I I have lost the ability to explain to people that are too stupid to realize I didn't ask them a question. Mm-hmm. I now just block. Yeah. I don't have time to explain to every single person that doesn't realize I didn't ask you a question. And they're like, oh, well, I can't have an opinion. You can't. I didn't ask for it, though. Right. It's you can. I didn't ask you for it. Right. It was interesting. Brianna Banks, I had Brianna Banks on, and she mentioned something about how the interaction with fans is so much different now on social media because back in the day, you know, they would have to come to events to see you. They would have to stand in line. They'd come see you dance. And those were the people that truly appreciated mm-hmm. you and would go out of their way to drive two hours to see you, would stand in line for an hour. So, you know, these were the people that really, like, they were fans like they loved you you know they're not gonna stand in line for two hours to be like julia you shouldn't have that tattoo but now with social media because people can just say whatever they want they can Mm -hmm. hide behind an anonymous avatar and they don't Mm -hmm. have to like tell you who they really Mm -hmm. are they'll just say fucking anything to you and it's become this like breeding ground for so much negativity so much criticism i mean some of the things that people say they think they know what you're thinking always like always so like if i if i were to be like you know i didn't ask you then people are like oh no if i if somebody said something horrible to me and i would be like dude i hear you i i don't really care well obviously you care you answered that means not i answered i answered you as a person Mm -hmm. i honestly don't really care like there is a difference. You can try to make it whatever you want to make yourself feel good. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm really explaining to you that your arrogance has no place here. Mm-hmm. That you're wasting your words and my space. And if anybody's going to care, it's going to be the other people who care about me, not me. So how about you spare them your BS? You know, I I just don't have time for the BS. Like the, right. it's too much. And if you're going to come on and... I will block you because you are too arrogant to realize I didn't ask you. Yeah. You are so I mute, arrogant. I mute people. So they That's on Twitter. So, Oh, okay. So they don't even know. But yeah, if I get someone aggressive on Instagram, I don't even bother responding. I just yeah. block them. Yeah, I just block to the second, the second you say something that at all triggers me just to be annoyed. Right. Just to be annoyed. And it's not I'm annoyed. I'm not annoyed at your words. Yeah. I'm annoyed that you. You think you're so fucking smart and important Mm -hmm. that you had a right to spew your venom at me. Right. It's your arrogance that gets you blocked. And also, too, I mean, there's a lot of cowardice behind that because they're not saying that to your face. Cowards. They know that you're never going to come after them and actually, like, show up at their door and be like, what do you mean by that? Yeah, yeah, right? I mean, can you imagine? Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine if, like, that was the case? Like, you you know, you show up at their door like, hey, you left that comment on my instagram what do you yeah. mean by that yeah the, oh my god they're all arrogant little cowards yeah and that is really if you're one of those people out there i'm going to tell you right now that's all we think of you yeah that is really all we think oh look another arrogant little coward who needs a hobby and a hug like that's <laughs> literally all that kind of entertains us before we go I have to go get a pedicure now, like, yeah. and, and move on with my life. Right, like, right, right. Would you give to new girls coming into the industry? Get a Sapphira. <laughs> get a Dude, what? A Sapphira. What's that? Oh my god! Wait, what's a Sapphira? A what? Sep S E P I R A account. Oh, oh, like a retirement, like IRA. Are we gonna have to have a meeting with no, this? No, actually, it's actually it's really sad. I have those, and I don't know anything about it. And I just set up a meeting with my financial advisor because I've just like let that money sit in there, and I haven't added anything to it. I've been uh, I, very financially responsible in that way. Okay, All but right. when I work for my parents, they set one up for me. Of course, mommy and daddy did. So <laughs> I still have that. I haven't touched it, but I haven't added anything to it. Okay, right. so you're saying. Like set up a retirement account. Yeah, set up a retirement account. Set up a savings account. Stash stuff away. Do your taxes. You don't want that coming after you. God, do your taxes. It's Jesus brutal. Christ. It's brutal. It's just brutal. I get letters from the IRS every year from, on performers who haven't paid their taxes telling me to put a lien on their income. Like it's all the time. Yeah. It's too much. You're I've never going to get got, away from the IRS. I've just now got Jenna on it. Yeah. Just now got her on it. She's she's getting that shit done. I'm yeah. Like, you need to get this done. Yeah, you do. So, um, 
yeah, no. Uh, us to put some money aside because you never know what's going to happen. And if mm-hmm. nothing else, you could decide, hey, you know what? I want to take a break and I want to go do this for a minute, but you can't do it if you don't have a little something stashed, mm-hmm. you know? So just have something stashed. And uh, that, so that's really super, super important. And also, um, <sighs> I would say whenever you're in a position where there's something you may not want to do, say no. But that's – that's it's too easy to say uh, and it means nothing because when you're in the situation, it, it all gets crazy. Has that ever happened to you? No. I I I have gotten into situ- – that's – situation is a really bad word because people are going to read bias into it. Okay, so – I I have put myself <laughs> into scenes that afterwards I said I will never do that again. I absolutely acknowledge that I had a right to walk out. Mm-hmm. And of course you're not going to get paid. I don't understand why people are like – get all upset like, yeah, but then she wouldn't have gotten paid. No, you didn't do the scene. Of course you're not going to get paid. Mm-hmm. You know what? If I asked my gardener to do something and then like part way through, he's like, you know what? I'm not doing this. I'm like, that's fair. I'll get somebody else. Like, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. but he's not going to ask for the money for it. Mm-hmm. It's not a thing. I think though that to be fair, a lot of these girls are probably in situations they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. And and also in sure. that case, a lot of girls like you got to do your fucking research, man. Do not show up for a company not having looked them up or having any idea what kind of scene you're going to be doing because I see that happened a lot like but even girls being think, upset that they are they, like you know doing a scene for OCD. that's okay it's I do the same thing we're both like straightening the tablecloth the tablecloth is making me crazy like, I'm like it's off it. here and then it's probably off on your side so you're probably pulling it back and then I'm going but it's not right <laughs> That's the worst. Okay. <laughs> you know, I get that. I it, I get that you, you, you say yes to something and, and you don't – partway through you realize, okay, I didn't ask enough questions. I didn't sign up for this. Or I didn't know I what didn't I was getting myself up, into. Yeah, I didn't know that it was going to go this far. Or, like me, I knew it was going to be something. But I didn't know if it was something I was going to like yet or yeah. something I wasn't going to like. Right. And therefore, this was my test to see if it was my thing or mm-hmm. not my thing. Mm-hmm. But because it was my test and I took it upon myself, I went through the whole thing because that was who I was. I was like, you know what? BDSM, whipped ass, kink. Right? You had a bad experience there, I remember. Yeah, but that 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 was not- An accident. It was an accident. Yeah, I mean, was, they, I've yeah, heard no, like it was, kink's amazing. I've heard like, wonder, only oh, no. wonderful things about yeah, no, kink. Kink is amazing, um, and, but accidents happen on. But set. they're aggr- but but the scenes, but the certain acts are are aggressive, and they're especially aggressive if you're not aggressive, right? Mm-hmm. So I decided I was going to sub, and I was going to do whipped ass, and like hours into this, I thought to myself, I am. I'm going to beat the shit out of the next person who hits me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Some, it's we're going to, it's going to go down. Okay? <laughs> right. The next person who spits on me, I'm decking. Right. Yeah. But then I realized, no, 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 you're the submissive. Yeah. So I recognized and I resigned myself to the situation that I decided I wanted to see if I would like, because it's not anybody else's fault. I use this as a testing ground. Right. So I, I finished my scene and then never did it again. I, I've done it as a dom, mm-hmm. but I've never done it again as a sub. Yeah. So that was my, my, my trial and error. But of course I went through with it because that's who I was. I was like, ah, you know, I can do anything for another hour that I could, I would die if I had to do for the rest of my life. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I can do this, you know, and, and, and I realized, you know, this is not, it's not something I am, so I won't do it again. Right. Um, but I, was I victimized by it? Absolutely not. Right. Absolutely not. A victim mean it entails that I didn't feel I had a voice. Mm-hmm. I absolutely knew I could have walked out. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So you didn't feel like personally violated. It was just like, this is not my cup of tea. This is not my thing. No, every time I got hit, I was like, I'm going to beat somebody. Uh, you hit me <laughs> again. Oh, uh, chick hit a nipple. Like, I was just like, you yeah. know, oh, my God. Like, just I'm not I'm not somebody. You, every time you strike me, I want to kill another member of your family. <laughs> like, it's just not OK. It's not OK. But at the end of the day. 
it was my decision to try something I didn't know mm-hmm. if it was my personality or not, mm-hmm. and it's not. Mm-hmm. So hence, I don't do it again. Right. Um. You know, uh, I could have been the dom and then decided, no, I think I'm a better sub and decide not to be the dom again. Like it's right. just, it's a trial and error. And and uh, I I feel fortunate enough to be in an industry where I can trial and error myself. I was going to ask know? you if uh, I've had a lot of girls tell me that they feel like porn has been a great, like safe place for them to try different, um, you know, sexual things and discover themselves sexually. Has that been the case for you? Um. Or do you feel like you kind of knew yourself bef- in a sexual way before you came into the industry? Uh, you're ever changing. Mm. You're ever changing. Who mm-hmm. I was when I did my first porn is not who I am today. And there was about three different people in there in the middle, depending on who I was. Like mm-hmm. at first, I was like, "Oh, I'm going to do it because I want to make extra money on the road dancing." Like mm-hmm. this was very financial, and then it went into, "Oh my god, people love me! Uh, don't you know who I am?" And then, <laughs> right, because that's the early twenties. Like you, or like you, like twenty four years old, you'd be like, "Excuse me." Don't I'm Julia know. and I will beat you down if you so you will lose your job. <laughs> I will get you fired, motherfucker. Like hey, you will never DJ in this town again. Like you 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 get a little attitude, which is why I always feel for the girls who kind of get everything handed to them right out the gate mm-hmm. because I'm like all gonna get mad at her but yeah. nobody gave her any skills to do with this stuff right like i was the first person that was standing there looking at some grown-ass man cu- cursing him out for playing the wrong dj song now i look at my behavior and i was like oh damn i was ugly and so lucky that somebody didn't pummel me in the parking lot like yeah i don't know who the hell do you think you are little girl yeah so so do you see some of these like younger divas kind of like lashing out on social media and just kind of laugh and feel like, oh, that was me? No, I didn't have social media by the grace of God. Of God. Right. For me too. Like, thank God the internet wasn't there to like capture all the bullshit that I pulled in my 20s. <laughs> We're so safe. We're I so know, safe. right? I would have victimized the hell out of myself. Yeah. So in any case, you know, but there was a lot of different people in there. And then I was in my 30s. 30. The most amazing age ever because you can be like, you better listen to me. I'm a 30 year old woman. You say I'm 29, the second 20. Yeah. Come yeah, out of yeah, your yeah. mouth. They'd be like, Shh, you're in your 20s. Yeah. You, but you say, thir- you, second you turn 30, you are like, I am a 30 year old woman. And people are like, oh, yeah, she got experience. <laughs> Did you say 29 and a half? 29 yeah. and three quarters. You'd be 29 and 11 months. They'd be like, 29. <laughs> like, <laughs> I have to listen to you. But that means that 40s are even better, right? But, okay, so 40. Because I'm in my first year of my 40s. Okay. So I'm like, I need someone to I'm tell in my, me. I'm in better. my last year okay. of my 40s. And the 40s were your best time 50 ever, is right? next. So I would say my, my finest ages were between... I would say between 35 and 42. Okay. But that's because I got hit really hard with perimenopause. Mm. I got hit hard. So I went through a lot of emotion, a lot of like there was a lot. You shot me. Okay. So I remember. Yeah. You can remember this. Aren't you? I remember. <laughs> so back in the day, I shot with her mother. So yes. your mom used to shoot me a lot, actually. Yeah. Your mom used to shoot me a lot. And so that's great. You know, I mean, what did I have to complain about back then? You know, no, you can't touch me when we're going to do this shoot because everything is like not Fake. It's R-rated. It's yeah. not X. Okay. Because that's how it was back like then. This far from I the swear vagina. sooner or later in this picture, I might have brushed up against his scrotum. Like it's yeah. just like you, you didn't actually touch each other in these stills. So, but that was our... You know, that was it. You know, Mm -hmm. you you just, I'm pretty. And then by the time you shot me, I was having hot flashes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I remember that. And I literally would have to stop because the sweat would just come. And it was like I was standing on the sun. And so, so my, those years have gotten trying Mm -hmm. just from, uh, 
physiological aspect, you mm-hmm. know, being female and, and going through hormonal changes. Fucking brutal. But my late 30s, that 40-ish, you know, I was like, I have my shit together. I know what position is my favorite. I'd be like, bitch, you're going to go down on me like this. I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, wait a minute. Yo next, yo next, you're next, you're next. Come on. Like I I had a I had a thing, you know. I had I had people that I wanted to work with so bad that I was like I will totally charge you so much less if I can just have sex with that person. Or Quasar will remember when I was doing a scene with Tony Rebus and I was like, can we do anal? <laughs> and he was like, I'm not paying you for anal. I go, that's not my question. <laughs> can we do anal? And I looked at Rebus, I'm like, can we do anal? And he's like, who am I to say no from a beautiful woman? So <laughs> you're you know Tony I mean? saying that in his accent. Yeah, yeah. So, who am I to say no? And then, of course. I know. And then Mike is like, I'm tragic. So <laughs> I'm just tragic. Um, God damn. So <laughs> oh, tragic. God. So in any case, you know, like it, there were all these varying people in there, mm-hmm. you know, like it used to be like, I'm not doing that for less than this. At this point, I was like, I'll show up for free if you can just give me so and so like, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I just want to bang that dude because he's hot. Like yeah. these are just totally different people. And now, I, you know, I'm a little bit like, oh. I should be naked anymore you know what i mean like i'm not even so sure my husband should see me naked right now like so it's hard because there's all these varying degrees of people when yeah. you've been you know somewhere for so long mm-hmm. you know you, you've you've morphed and changed and accidentally reinvented and never did it on purpose mm-hmm. and so you just continuously evolve mm-hmm. and uh so yeah my scenes evolved um, you know, they started out pretty vanilla, then they went into something. Well, they started out vanilla. No, they started out artsy, went into vanilla, ended up being like, I'll do that, bro bang. And then went into a little bit insecure. Mm. And and that's just my aging process, mm-hmm. right? So right now I'm working on the insecure thing, which mm-hmm. is no. I have not retired. Because she doesn't get asked that question enough. Yeah. Yes. I stopped doing boy, girl. No. It's not because I got married. I've been with the same man for seven years and was fucking everyone. So just no. However, in my hormonal situation, I've taken a step back because I kind of need to focus on my health for a minute mm-hmm. before I shoot, shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, if I do boy, girl again, it will probably be for my website. Mm-hmm. But the girl, girl, I will eventually do with other people, uh, with other companies again. But right now, I just am focusing on my health and I'm in college. So I'm also focusing a lot on that, mm-hmm. which is when you're studying a lot, you sit a lot. Mm-hmm. So I I am trying to get my health back. And everybody can just, you know, take a chill for a second. <sighs> Give me a minute and realize after since 91 to now, I've been pretty consistent. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> Taking a sabbatical. <laughs> So how do you feel about um, like the new kinds of scenes that everybody's shooting, like how, the trends that are in porn today, like the like how you're either like a teen or a MILF? I mean, has that been something that's been a little bit frustrating to you? Do you find that you're just like pigeonholed into particular roles? I don't know that it – I have a lot of children out there apparently, <laughs> a lot of stepchildren. I have sex with a lot of my stepchildren. Um, and their friends, um, you know, I don't really think about it. It's par for the course. It's okay. It's, it's being, uh, it's being human. Mm-hmm. I think no matter what happens in your life, you, you, as you age, you change gears and people see you as different roles. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why the industry should be any different. It's the microcosm of the macrocosm. Like, right. Uh, you know, if I were 
I don't know, if I were working in a restaurant, you know, people would be like, oh, look at the cute hot ma- or cute hot waitress. And then, you know, by the end of it, they'd be like, oh, Polly's been working here a long time with the pineapple <laughs> hairdo. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't matter kind of where you're at. Yeah. Like, you're viewed a certain way, and that's placed upon you well before the industry gets a hold of a title. Right. You know, and then they just work with what they've got. You know, it's, it's a reality. We aren't making the stuff up. We're just kind of embellishing on what people are already doing. Do you find that, like, you encounter, like, ageism? And is it frustrating to you at all? Uh, I don't – I think the most the ageism that, that could happen, I'm placed on myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I recognize, if anything else – in college, I see it. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. You know, like when the teacher turns and he's talking to the, all the students, he's like, and then he's like, does anybody, and, and then all of a sudden he'll be like, yo, so let's talk about TV. And then he'll look at me and he'll be like, can you tell them something about when TV was, and I'm like this, and I, I do this every time because I'm loud, right? I go, you just called me old in the middle of a classroom. He's like, no, I didn't. I go, you did. Y'all heard it, right? <laughs> teacher said I was old. Why do you have to drag me down this road of dismay? You know? <laughs> I, I mean, I ask you that because I am like starting, I, you know, I'm 40 and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm at that point where I'm just like. I think you do it more to yourself than anybody yeah. because you are thinking, are they viewing me? Like they view, like I viewed that other one that was, that still 100%. shopping at Forever 21. 100%. And. I remember when I was. By the way, I was tw- never Forever 21. I never shopped at that store. <laughs> It's way too pedestrian. Okay. <laughs> when I was 22, I was dating uh, somebody who worked at Wicked, and he had a very good friend. I know you know who I'm talking about. I don't know if I'm going to name her, but he had a very good friend who was in probably the age I am now, and they were very, very close, and I am like found out later that basically he was fucking her the whole time that we were supposedly together and I was like so naive and I didn't know. And I remember being like so angry and competitive with her and being like, oh, well, she's just this old bitch and I'm this hot like 22-year-old, you know, like fuck her. And, you know, what did she know? And like how pathetic, you know, is she trying to be like, you know, hot at her age? And I am now her age. But, but wait a minute. Are you now thinking, oh, this is what she was thinking of me? Yes. Because now you're going yes. – Oh, she was looking down her nose at me. Going, yes. Poor little girl. Yeah, you stupid little girl. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now, and like, the roles realize, are reversed. And now I'm you realize like, I wasn't as hot as I thought I was because she was looking at me like, oh, aren't you sweet? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the perspective change has so been really interesting. I know it's, it's, it's funny because I'm condescending on both ends of the spectrum, I right? Know, but she was <laughs> condescending me. <laughs> but yeah, so and you know, I have some friends who are much younger than me and um like I went to the Playboy Midsummer Night stream party with um who did I go? I went with uh yeah, like Bailey Rain mm-hmm. and I was like invisible. Yeah. And um and I was like fuck, man. And then the other well, day you get to a point where you rely on your name. Yeah, well, you get you rely yes. on your name. It's not so much the it's looks true. now you're relying on your name. You you rely on your past. Right. To dictate how your day is going to be or the how that moment or your experience. Mm-hmm. So it used to be like where you'd be like, "I was hot. What's your name? Holly Randall." "Oh, you're Holly Randall." Yeah. Now it's like, "Oh, hi. Who are you? Julianne?" "Oh, you're Julia Ann." But but the initial hello is really just like, who's mm-hmm. this uh, mature lady who's here, right? <laughs> but a lot of it is you're putting on yourself. You've right. already decided how that other group is going to view you right. according to your own experience in right. life. And I think it doesn't may help or may not be true. that I'm surrounded constantly by 20-year-olds and I'm shooting but naked 20-year-olds all the time. But, and I'm like – Yeah, but think about it. The – you're also getting the experience of this. Right. Recognizing that they think you're hot and they would bang you in a hot second. I don't know about that. Oh, yes, they would. I don't know about that. Oh, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I hear about how Holly's so fucking hot. Holly's so really? fucking hot. Really? Yes. Go on. No, I'm going to tell you <laughs> Holly's fucking hot. And because I also do makeup. 
Uh huh. I do makeup a yes. lot, especially for Quasar. And so I'm the ones here. No, Holly. Oh, Holly's so hot. You know, or they'll be on the. It, Jenna, fuck. Holly's so hot. Well, Jenna loves MILFs, so. Yes, but that's not the point. The point is, is that they think that's. Okay. Dana DeArmond, mm-hmm. 10 years ago, uh, when Diana Loren came back and was doing some stuff, she was like, fucking Diana's so fierce. Mm-hmm. She's just fierce mm-hmm. you know and she's older than both of us yeah right so right. you know the realities are is that we are in an industry where you can't look at these girls that you shoot and think they're just like the average girl that's on the street i know we, I have these skewed women, perspectives but even living in la these women that we sh- that that are shot in our industry mm-hmm. are a cut above yeah they are um, they are in a whole nother level, whole nother playing field of acceptance of other women being beautiful and mm-hmm. not feeling like it takes away from them. Mm-hmm. They're actually like, they will look at you and be like, you're so hot. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Where you'll have another girl look at you and be like, she ain't nothing. Like, yeah. like the, uh, uh, which what we call civilians. <laughs> but the women in our industry, all well, in all. A lot of them love women. Are very much pro. I'm going to tell you, you're fucking hot. Mm-hmm. You are hot. She's fucking hot. Like, it's, yeah. it's different. Yeah. Like, we're actually... Uh, we can really build each other's self esteem. On- Do you think that there's like a camaraderie there too? Because we're kind of like the black sheep of the entertainment industry. So sometimes, it, it like was more before social media, mm. it, it, the social media has, like I said, I think split us apart a little bit, and mm-hmm. then in some levels clicked us. Yeah. Although contract girls were often clicked, but it mm-hmm. wasn't because they really clicked themselves. It was because the companies kind of clicked them like right we're gonna make our own click you right, know right, and right. then we don't want you to hang out with the other ones right 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 so uh but yeah no i think that we're pff, fucking girls are like holly randall's so hot like we, i hear it so much it's ridiculous By in fact way, i'm sitting there going um i'm julia ann <laughs> <laughs> so by the way weird. this is my favorite topic that we've <laughs> Let's talk more about what other people say about me. Uh, no, but seriously, That's so though, great. I do, more about me. I do recognize, though, that like I look in the mirror, and and this is so funny because it's like it's so counterintuitive against once what I know because you know mm-hmm. I'll shoot girls who are themselves might be kind of insecure and be like, oh, I need to get my boobs done, or oh, this is wrong with me, this is wrong with me, and I'm like, you're out of your mind, like you're fucking stunning, like how do you not look in the mirror and see that, right? And I can even see some people who might have like certain flaws here or there, but overall they're a beautiful person, and a lot of it has to do with their energy, yeah. and you know I really admire them as a human being. So right. collectively, like. I, gorgeous. They're gorgeous, but I look in the mirror and all I see is those little flaws. And I know, like, intellectually, the way that I'm seeing myself I see Walmart. Is, is wrong. You see Walmart? I see, when I look in the mirror, I see Walmart. What do you mean you see Walmart? I see Walmart people. <laughs> I'm to the point now where I see Walmart people. I look in the mirror and I go, oh, yeah, I've turned into that. <laughs> I need to go get a job at Walmart. Like... <laughs> Literally on Walmart people. Like yeah. I look in the mirror now and I see the aging Midwesterner that, you know, has a little too had too much fucking Popeye's chicken and I'm like, my my skin's getting that color. I got cougar chest, which yeah. is uh, you know, from the tanning I from know. back in the day, I, I, I have I have wrinkles in places that I didn't know you could get wrinkles. I'm like, what's happening? And then one angle, I'm good, but I turn the other way, and I'm like, who's that bitch? Like, I know. Like the worst is literally, when you I'm your like camera. two different people. I'm like two different yes. people. I'll see pictures of myself and I'll be like, oh. I remember once I was shooting. One side's like Tarjay. <laughs> The other side's like Walmart. I was shooting for Twisties once, and we were shooting an 8K, right, on the red. And I went to go. Nobody wants their porn in this. You guys know that, right? (laughs) It's, like, got to be a number one fan gripe. We downgraded to 6K. It's okay. Thank (laughs) God. 
But I went to go slate in front of the camera, um, and it was a low shot because we were like shooting up, and we were shooting like oh, Kira Noir. It was like perfect. She looks great from every angle, right? And I went to go slate, and so I'm looking at the rushes later. And I just see that, and it's in slow mo too, right? Yeah. And so I just see this slow mo of this upshot of me in 8K, and I'm like, slow. <laughs> <laughs> and I just freaked out. I was like, oh my God, I'm so ugly. And so my boyfriend comes home, and I'm like on the couch throwing a sulk, and he's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I'm so ugly. Why didn't you ever tell me how ugly I was? How come nobody told me? And he was like, what the f- fuck and i was like i'm so ugly and like three days i was in like the worst oh, funk shit. and so now i'm like i'm not slating anymore i'm not getting in front of that fucking camera like it's no so way wrong yeah yeah see me i'm like i have got to get my shit back together because okay so there was a point in time where like janine was like I don't know if you guys remember, but she didn't kind of let herself go a little bit. She had a, mm-hmm. she had some moments, yes. right? She gained a lot of weight. You know, of course, all the tattoos, which is fine. Right. I think they're great. But but she gained a lot of weight. She wasn't taking care of herself. She was really much in a funk. And I'm now there. And it's funny because I'm one year behind her. So when mm-hmm. I was telling her, she's like, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. I totally know this. I yeah. just did this. And she said, I, I woke up one morning and I was like, am I really going to go out like that? <laughs> am I am I really going out like this so what you have to do Julia is you need to go on YouTube and you need to look up exercises for women over 50 and 60 and I said if you ever say these <laughs> words to me again I will put on Twitter everything I know about you I swear to God if you ever say <laughs> to look up videos of women over 60 I will have you killed and she's like no 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 I'm just saying I did this and I was like my god that 60 year old woman can do that I have got to be able to do that. So, so, so now she's all like 136 pounds, she's fucking ripped off because she's naturally that muscular person mm-hmm. that has the baby and then afterwards looks better. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how that happens. So with me, I haven't had children, but if I even had children, there would be no coming back. Like mm-hmm. there's just none. But her, it was literally like her body went, you don't have a kid. You should be rocking. Yeah. Like, why? And so, you know, now she's like, I I have to tell you, there was like this period of time because she'd always been so solid and her body was always so great. I kind of liked it. I'm a little fucked up there. Like I (laughs) I was like, look at her. She's a little heavy. I'm kind of liking this. And instead of next to me, I'm like, so I got my shit together, right? Like I'm looking good. Now she's like, I'm 136 pounds. I've been rocking this shit, Julia. Let's go do this. And I'm like, I don't want to stand next to you anymore. (laughs) Fuck you. No. So now I'm like, I have got to get back into shape. I cannot go out like that because (laughs) she's not going out like that. How is Janine doing? She's good. We're going to be at Portland uh, Exotica. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, in June. So the first week, I think it's like the first weekend in June, and we're going to be signing there. But now I'm like, I don't want to sign next to you because you look good. I liked it better when you look like shit. What the <laughs> hell? Because that's true friendship. So one thing that I know that you're extremely passionate about is animal rescue. And actually, when we were talking on the phone the other day, you uh, you had a parrot that you had just rescued, right? I did. So how many – do you just foster animals a lot? Like how do you – how exactly do you work in animal rescue? It really depends. Um, <laughs> I'm older. <laughs> depends. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I just got it. Uh, you know, one time Je- Jenna Fox asked me, do, do pets make – do do they make diapers for um, for um, older people too? I was like, no, they, they only make – what's wrong with you? This is- <laughs> Wait, who else needs diapers? I don't know. Oh, babies, did you think like I babies? Oh, I don't I know. See. But the only thing I say to her every day is what's wrong with you? Something's wrong with you. <laughs> happens every day. What's wrong with you? Something's wrong with you. I'm special. Yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> so um, animal rest, you know, it really depends on the situation. Like, okay, so the other day, uh, Melissa Monet is like, um, there's a hoarding case. We have a problem. Mm-hmm. Do you want to reach out to uh, Reptile Rescue mm-hmm. um, and uh, and see if they can take any any reptiles? and. And uh, and I said, well, how many? And she's like, well, I'm I'm not quite sure. So I actually went to the house, and altogether there was probably like 400 animals or something, Jeez. from what I understand. How big was the house? Small, normal, modular kind of. 
Okay, so it's not like a ranch or anything like no, that. No, wow. no, it was like a trailer park kind of situation. So no, it's very, very normal size. And uh, but there's parrots and pigs and guinea pigs and uh, rabbits and turkeys and tortoises and parrots and uh, reptiles and and the list goes on ducks and turkeys and and pigeons and doves and I, like I could literally just keep going like there just was name every all the animals. there was literally everything but probably horses like mm-hmm. everything else was there I swear to you and um, so I went in to get uh, the reptiles there were no reptiles somebody already swept the reptiles and I ended up with but I ended up taking out five tarantulas. Mm-hmm. Um, five random paradise fish that were in their own little things. Um, that I just grabbed. We put it. They, I got them in Tupperware. Um, well, Melissa and Manet brought them to me in Tupperware. I got the trans and the tarantulas, and then the one parrot I took out of all the parrots. How many pets do you have? <laughs> I'm not legally allowed to say. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, it's not that bad. Um. Um. I have a few dogs. I don't have like a. I don't have a ton of dogs. Like because I always try to be within my limit unless I foster because then the foster, you know, obviously mm-hmm. it's going to go. So mm-hmm. it's not like the city can be like you have too many dogs. Uh, so I try to stay within reason there. Um, I have uh, I have the two Chinese water dragons, <laughs> a parrot, the dogs, How many and dogs? the dogs. Okay, and. <laughs> I might have four. Um, I don't think that's insane. No, it's not. But I think the legal limit might be three. Okay. So Does it, is it like per square footage or something like that, right? No, it's, it's like be- county. It's per household. Really? Yeah. It will be like whatever the city is. So like Glendale was actually two uh-huh. unless you got a personal kennel license and then you could have four. Oh, weird. Yeah. Because my parents, well, they don't now. They have four, but they had five, but they have a 30-acre ranch. Yeah, but. you didn't notice. Yeah, but honest, they, but those are the words. They didn't notice. Like, technically, they may only be allowed three. Interesting. So if they had them all licensed to the city, the city would be like, you can only have three. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that there was actually a limit on how many dogs you could have. There like, I knew limits. that, like, there was a certain point that, like, they would call you a hoarder and come in and take your animals. Yeah, no. But I didn't, I didn't realize that there was actually, like, no, some kind of law there. there are that makes city sense. limits. I think that they were wanting to raise it to either four or five. Like, mm-hmm. in San Diego, there's various parts where you can have five and six. Mm-hmm. But up here, it's generally in that two, three okay. kind of range. Um my chihuahua's going to die soon, though, so I'll be down to three and I'll be good. He's a horrible <laughs> animal, so I don't, I'm just saying. Everybody who knows the stories understands. Uh, and then I've got – I would have said I had five fish, mm-hmm. but I woke up this morning and I had three extra ones. Oh. So apparently someone had some babies. Oh, boy. So you have a lot of pets. I do. But animals I woke are amazing. up in the morning. I had to feed the dogs. Then I had to feed the parrot. <laughs> then I had to feed the Chinese water dragons. And then I fed the fish. And then I had to feed myself. And then I had to come here. <laughs> and that's how that went. Do you ever? Um, I'm, yeah, I mean, like for me, I I, I want to work. There's part of me that like wants to work in animal rescue and stuff. But like, I have a real problem with like. I can't go to a pound because I want to take all the dogs home. Like it really gets me. Like it, I get really like attached and it makes me – nothing you know can kind of get me in the way that dogs can get me. I can cure you of that. How's that? So the very first time I decided to pull, pull a lot mm-hmm. and that was actually because I had to go to the shelter looking for another dog that had gotten um, dumped. Mm-hmm. And in that I – I went to that shelter and I was like, oh, my God, there's a lot going on here. And then Melissa Monet was like, you know, that there's a list of like 70 something Chihuahua and Chihuahua mixes that are are at threat of being euthanized at the East Valley shelter. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy shit, let's go. So she and I got a rescue to back us. We took 13 dogs out, took them all to my house 
set them all up in various rooms. Everybody had their own little kennel run with their mm-hmm. own wee-wee pads and everything so I could see who had diarrhea and mm-hmm. who wasn't drinking and who wasn't eating. And so everybody had their situations. Right. So 13 plus mine. So once you have 16 and 17 dogs in your home. Yeah, it's a little much. You develop the skin to be like, you have got to go. You have got to find your people. Like, we have got to find your people. Because as much as I love you, you cannot stay here. Like, (laughs) so that's what cured me of wanting to keep all animals. Yeah. But the other thing is. My whole purpose is to find the best situation for that creature, Mm -hmm. and I'm not the best situation. Mm -hmm. Like once I have a certain amount of animals, I recognize everyone else, as much as I love them, will fall through some crack. And, and, And not just that, but that it will take away from my resources for my own. Therefore, I can only handle this, mm-hmm. and everybody else has to. I, it is actually in their best interest to find their people. Um, so once you start doing that, and you start recognizing it's about finding something better than you, yeah, th- then you're okay with it because it's better than you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I rescued a dog actually when I was shooting for Digital Playground um, named Maggie, and uh, is this the one you, that was on the street? Mm-hmm. The one that Billy Visual helped me catch? I think so. Because I think I started to argue with you about it a little bit. Prob- I was like, maybe. you have to take it to the shelter. And I was like, no. And I was like, no, you have to take it to the shelter. And you're like, no. And I was like, no, you have to take it to the shelter because you don't know like her people. Like, yeah. You can always go back and get her, but yeah. you have to take her to the shelter. And you were like, no. Nope. And I was like, okay, I can't talk to her anymore. <laughs> I can't. We're gonna we did put out posters. We did put out everywhere right. that I could possibly list her, and I held her for a week. But then um, you can I, do that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, honestly, we did everything that we could to try to uh, uh, right. help her find her home. But right. anyways, uh, my assistant ended up taking her, and she is like the best life, the best life. He takes her That's on awesome. like hikes. He they go camping out in the mountains mm-hmm. together. I mean, literally, she yeah. has her own Instagram, and she is the happiest most spoiled dog in the world and nothing makes me happier than seeing the life that he gives her is like beyond what i could have given her so i'm super glad that's and that's the point is that you have to get them to where they have to go yeah and you are just that place and if you hold on you can't help anybody else you know you get stuck and you're like my whole purpose is i want to help i can't help if i have no place to help i have no room to help yeah so you have to get your ego out of the way in order to make room to help um, I just have one now that came from the vet and I have no problem with the gateway animal hospital in Glendale. I, my, I have used them my entire adult life. My, my parents use them. My grandparents use them. Absolutely adored this vet. Did ever, I spent so much money there. It's absolutely, it's like literally ridiculous, mm-hmm. but I have completely soured because this It's the second time I've taken a blood donor from them. But somebody dropped off a dog there. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to find a place for this dog, they keep the dog in a cage for two fucking years. Use her as a blood donor for all other animals that are coming in. And then when I took her from them, she was sick. She was urinating everywhere. I had to have her tested for all kinds of things. I took her to a specialty hospital and everything else because they basically this is what was said to me. We can't absorb the cost on this dog if she's sick. You bled this dog for two years. You took her life. You soaked her of blood. You made a living off of her. You used her to save lives, and now you owe her life nothing? Wow. I I was so angry. I didn't know that that, that hospitals did that, that just kept like a donor dog. They can, they can. In some places, though, like like the owners, like let's say you work at the vet or you Mm -hmm. are the vet, right? Right. And you have your own dogs and you're like, I'm going to bring my dog in just in case, you know, so that way you have blood standing by if you need it. Right. Right. It's got to come from somewhere, of course. Right. But to steal her life and to then not owe her life after you made money off of her to me was ethically reprehensible. 
Oh, that's really disturbing. I, I, and I, it's very hard to let go of your vet yeah. when, when you've had them like forever. Mm-hmm. But um, I've never been so disgusted in my life. And, you know, it's one thing to have done to do the blood donor thing. I realize there's a lot of things that we don't like in life and, and okay. And it doesn't thrill me. But to owe her life nothing. Yeah. After she's sick, you've been giving other dogs blood from a dog that potentially has an ailment and you don't know about it or you do. So either you don't know about it, which means you've spent no time, had paid no attention to the medical needs or the medical uh, uh, status Mm -hmm. of a dog that you're using her blood for other dogs or you do know and you didn't care. Wow. So what are uh, these are our options. Right. Either way, you're you're a tool. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that one. So I have her, and because I took her in, and and she has moments of being incontinent, we've never been able to pinpoint what the problem is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've kept her. Are you gonna plan keep to foster her. her out at all, or are you just gonna keep her? She's gonna stay. Okay. Because I, it's it to me. It, that's another thing. I I will never rescue an animal that I don't feel I'm willing to be stuck with. Right. And this is something I'd said to other rescuers uh, when because the, they keep getting stuck, and and I and I they kept wanting like rescue to pull animals, and I'm like, okay, but what happens when it doesn't work out? We can't find a place for this animal. Or this animal is sick. Or there's something that where this animal is unadoptable. Then this animal ends up being transferred to the founder, and mm-hmm. now the founder has too many animals. So that's got to stop. So here's this is what you do. You look at this animal and you say, I really, 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 really want our rescue to pull this animal. Am I willing? to take responsibility for the animal that I want the rescue to, to pull for right. the rest of its life if this goes wrong. Right. And I go, because if you're not, don't you ask this rescue to pull it. Yeah. Because you're all going to, when it goes wrong, you all keep stashing it at the same person's house. Mm-hmm. And that person is going to, is overrun. Right. So it's unfair. So I try to only also rescue what I truly believe. If I look at the same, I'm going, am I willing to spend the rest of your life with you? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Then I will rescue you. Right. Well, that makes sense. Because not everything's perfect, man. Yeah. You get that animal and all of a sudden you realize that animal's got like cancer or seizures or or it's highly aggressive or it has thyroid problems, whatever it is. And, and then people are like, I don't want to adopt that dog. Well, now it's your dog. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Julia, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. You are awesome. Um, we are going to do a little Q and a for my patron members only. I had a bunch of people sending questions, so I'm going to ask her a few more. Okay. Um, Otherwise, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so Instagram is the real Julia and live. If you see it in any other fashion, spelled any other way, it is not me. It is not my assistant <laughs> pretending to be me and I need money. No. I will never ask you to send me money on social media. So that's it. Uh, on Twitter, it's the real Julia Ann, and or you can go to my website, which is JuliaAnn dot com. JuliaAnn dot com or the real JuliaAnn dot com. Whatever, <laughs> I have them all. Awesome, and you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And if you like this show and you want to support me, go to patreon.com slash Unfiltered, where you can listen to this Q&A that we're going to do. Also, Julia signed a bunch of vintage they are vintage. vintage prints that my mom shot of her. They're pretty, pretty cool. Um, and a lot of other things. So thank you guys so much. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>